Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. We welcome you back to part two of a two-part series in which we're dealing with more livable communities, uh, cities in particular, and the emphasis on the program last week and again this week has to do with making your community more friendly to pedestrians uh, on foot or on bicycle or as they move around. <clears throat> and so also to draw people back into the central part of their cities. And uh, last week was pretty much about what was going on in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho and its neighboring areas, including the wonderful Centennial Trail that's in Washington and Idaho. This program is going to be a little more emphasis on the future planning of not what has been done, but where we may be going from here. And we hope our program is helpful to, to other communities throughout the Pacific Northwest and into Western Canada where this program is aired. I welcome to the program, first of all, Mike Gridley. He is the attorney for the city of Coeur d'Alene. And Mike, welcome back from last week. It Thank was you. most informative. We look forward to another discussion. Thank you, Tony. And equally uh, excited to have Mr. Vern Newby back, who is the chair of the city of Coeur d'Alene Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee. And as I indicated last week, he has served for 16 years on the Coeur d'Alene School District. And once again, it's nice to have you back, Vern. Thank you very much. And equally pleased to have Chris Kopstad, who is a former city council uh, member of the city of Coeur d'Alene and also served nine years on the planning commission. And he now serves as the executive director of the North Idaho Centennial Trail Foundation. And Chris, it's great to have you back. Thank you, Tony. And as always, we're pleased to have our regular panelist, Erna Reinhardt, who is the director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and Erna will start today's questioning. Welcome to the show. Our topic today is, is pedestrian-friendly cities, and I would like for each of you to go around and explain a little bit about, it sounds like a very basic question, but what is a pedestrian-friendly city? Chris, let's start with you. Well, you know, a pedestrian-friendly city is a, a city that can accommodate safely everyone. All users, uh, you know, pedestrians also include uh, people in wheelchairs, elderly that uh, you know have difficulty picking their picking their feet up like some of the younger people, uh, children. Uh, you know, that's that that's a safe city. And what are the th some of the things, Mike, that you need to have in place as a city to have a pedestrian-friendly city? Well, there are several things. One are good sidewalks, smooth sidewalks. Uh, curb cuts, and that's something that's required by law uh, to aid, and it, as Chris said, it aids people with strollers, people in wheelchairs, all the different kinds of people. Uh, little things like the timing of lights, uh, crosswalks, uh, so you don't have to be an Olympic sprinter to get across when the light turns green. Make it so it gives you time, gives you notice uh, uh, to get across. Um, slowing traffic down. People don't want to walk if they feel threatened. So creating a place where they feel like they can walk safely, they're not threatened by vehicle traffic, uh, it's some of the keys that we look at. And Vern, you are so involved in, in schools. How do schools play an important part in, in making some of these things work well? well? In the schools, we teach to having the kids use the crosswalks where we have them and to watch for traffic hazards out in the streets. So, we, we try to make it so that the motorists are <coughs> in a, a situation where they, they know that the kids pretty well use a behavior that can be anticipated. And those crossings where the kids have to get in front of the vehicles, they're either controlled with a, a flagger or some other means. And the kids can get across and the motorists know that that's going to be a, a safe crossing for them. So uh, I guess education would be the number one issue there. It seems like one of the, one of the, just the basic things would be to make sure that all of your schools, and this probably is the case, but just to make sure that they have things like bicycle racks that are in a convenient location so that kids can ride their bike and be able to park it safely and um, not be vandalized and those kinds of things, right? That would be true and also something that we haven't investigated specifically for this, but in today's society with uh, as much electronics as we have now, it's, it's getting to be more affordable to put uh, video cameras in, in sensitive spots like that. So 
you have kids bringing their bikes to school and of course kids forget lots of things like the locks for their bikes and so there's a lot of bicycles that are at school that, that don't have any security to them so that would help out as well. Excellent. My introduction is quite long to get you to react to it. I have had the privilege of being introduced to some model communities around America and part of this was through the University of Idaho when they did a wonderful symposium on uh, livable communities and we did programs on this show. Uh, there's one in Tennessee where over 50 years ago they purchased land, a city and a county, and let it uh, and used you know, property tax uh, in, a little bit increased to pay for it over time and then develop it. And, and they have a section that they built an incredible industrial park and went around the country and invited people in, non-polluting, high-paying jobs because everything was there for them, a commercial section. and downtown redeveloped it for professional programs. And then there's a city in uh, California where some sociologists got together, convinced the city council, where people like Chris was always supportive of this here. Uh, they would, wanted to develop a new section of the city and every home has a, a, a rather large garden in the back and there's m many trees and very narrow streets, less asphalt, less concrete. They all face south and from all of this kind of remarkable planning uh, in the summertime in that particular community with all the foliage, the temperature is 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the city. How it really saves on energy and every home sold and there's a great waiting list. There's a community in Boise by the Grossman family where they developed a remarkable community and for example you cannot have a post office, uh, you cannot have a mailbox at your home. You have to go down to the country store where everybody meets everybody every day when they get their mail. So that long introduction leads me to my question. And again, I'll start with you, Mike. Not only pedestrian-friendly communities, but uh, are there other things that you're looking at for the future? This is a very, very good project, but are there other things you can do to say people want to be in Coeur d'Alene, or they want to be in Post Falls, or, or Hayden, or Rathdrum, or Spokane, wherever it is? Uh, can we learn, as she said last week, on looking at the internet, can we learn other things we can do so people really enjoy being here or visiting here? Well, I'm not sure if you're asking what other communities can do to promote active living or what are they looking to well, come here? Well, my example was that how these different communities had all different kind of creative ways okay. of making it not only economically a prosperous place but also environmentally friendly place so that people want to either live there or they want to visit there. Yeah. It's the pedestrian, I'm not taking away from the pedestrian uh, uh, bicycle paths and, and walkways and all, but doesn't it also encompass more? Yeah, I think so. And I think we all travel and have been to places that, that we enjoy. And I think most of those are places where we can walk easily, we can get around without a car, where we don't feel threatened by traffic or f by uh, uh, dangerous uh, surroundings. Uh, and I think more and more people are deciding where to live based on those, those factors. And we have uh, recognize, I think, uh, there's been a book called The Creative Class, I think, and those oh, are... One, one of my favorites, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Richard Florida from Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. entrepreneurs... We're going to try to bring him here, by the way. Well, yeah, and that's the kind of people, entrepreneurs who are looking to establish a business. They can establish it in Coeur d'Alene or they can establish it in any place. If they have an interest in being outdoors, enjoying our climate, enjoying our water, enjoying the natural amenities, uh, and we make it easy for them to do that, they're more likely to bring their business here. Um, I think more and more, same way with the Ironman, as Fern talked about uh, the other day, the Ironman has brought a lot of people to Coeur d'Alene and they like what they see because they can do things here that they can't do in other urban areas. So uh, it's, it's... And some communities have built-in things. We have a built-in, a, a large pool called Lake Coeur d'Alene uh, right at the edge of our city. So there are some things in Tubbs Hill which is, was a, a wise decision by many people to make that into a park, but even cities that don't have that kind of jewel setting right at their city like an incredible lake, uh, they, other things they can do that, uh, like the city in, in uh, Tennessee does, didn't have those particular characteristics. Vern, maybe I'll turn to you and, and you can add to that what Certainly. you would recommend. Certainly. Well, we have a really good example, I think, just north of the city, and that would be the city of Dalton Gardens. There was a, a large outcry from the motoring population when the city of Dalton Gardens dropped their speed limits from 35 all the way down to 25. 
but it, it certainly didn't hurt their real estate values there and from my perception it's certainly been a better place to be around. I know I cycle through there frequently occasionally I'll run uh, jog around that area to and from work and and it's a more pleasant place to be and overall with the people getting out in the streets being able to walk through that small village if you will um, they, they enjoy that type of environment so as we can propagate that type of a setting into the city of Coeur d'Alene and Hayden and Post Falls it'll become a more and more advantageous community. For it us. even increases uh, property values doesn't it? It sure it's a does. good investment. Chris would let you add to this uh, and your recommendations about what are all the different kind of things uh, as someone that's been experienced a long time and yourself uh, in city government uh, that can cause people to want to live in that community. Well, we were talking about the economic benefits and with businesses coming, you know, businesses want, uh, they want places for their employees to go. They want their, their employees to be able to recreate during the day, during working hours, during lunch breaks, during breaks. Uh, when we have walkable communities or safe uh, trail systems uh, and, and, and sidewalk systems through our communities, that, that's a definite advantage to the, to the, the employer. They have an opportunity to get their employees out to get some fresh air and uh, and break some of the tension. You know, you remind me of something. That's what's good about conversation is it's something I just thought of after almost two programs now. That if you have friendly pedestrian communities, and I know a number of people from large multinational corporations, and their wisdom is they're providing for their employees on-site exercise areas, daycare for children. They're very smart to do that. So when you do all of that, and, and Vern talking about you know, maybe walking or running to work. Just think how much you save in your budget uh, each year if you are letting that automobile set at home more. So there's those, there's, there's those personal financial benefits for uh, the finances of a particular family. Absolutely, especially especially today when you go to try to fill up your vehicle. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a it's it's expensive. Yeah, it's only one thing we're seeing too because it's not just personal benefit, but the businesses benefit because healthcare costs are going up so much. Yes. Yeah. And even in our community, I think there's a uh, uh, a, a a movement sponsored, I think, by the Harris Dean Insurance and KMC to get everybody out walking. And you'll see a lot of our citizens wearing these little pedometers, and they've made commitments to get so many steps in. Well, that's good for our health, but it also reduces the cost of health care and reduces the amount of money businesses have to spend. So it's a real win uh, for all of us. There's a competition going on between organizations. And, of course, Kootenai mm -hmm. Medical Center wins almost every time because they're the largest employer in North Idaho. Mm -hmm. uh, but North Idaho College has participated in that, and there's even between divisions here uh, a trophy. And I must say our division has won that trophy on one occasion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that does, that, that has all those benefits, and it's, you can make it into almost a sport or a, a fun uh, process. Yeah. Erna Reinhardt. You guys have stolen my question. <laughs> 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 no, I think hopefully this will segue right into my question. Um, I know the city of Coeur d'Alene and various different organizations and businesses in our community have in the past participated in the National Bike to Work Day, I believe it's called. And I think that that is such an awesome event, but it is just one day out of the year. And my question was, um, being active people that you are, and some of you are business owners, um, are there some things that employers could do, some things that businesses could do to encourage their employees or encourage their customers to walk or bike in, the, in, a, in a more regular manner. And, and Chris, let's start with you, if you have any thoughts on, on those lines. Uh, I'd, let me pass on to that okay. a little one bit. Of, one of the Hi, things sorry. for cyclists even is, is showers. Right. You know, I work at the city, and I'm fortunate that uh, there's a shower there. So sometimes uh, go out on, even on a, uh, at noon and go for a quick bike ride and come back sweaty. So something as simple as that. Uh, uh, and way other places to change and just I think just also supporting it uh, uh, leading if your leaders walk or show that you don't have to park right in front of the building that it's okay to walk I think that uh, that helps yeah, I was thinking flexible work hours you know so you don't have to be there right at seven maybe but you know That's if, if an employer had flexible work hours that may help facilitate people to, that can ride their bike in the summertime or the springtime sure. or 
fall. And, and likewise, just like with the schools, if the businesses have accommodations for bicycles or whatever type of equipment you might be using to transport yourself without vehicles, that makes it a lot easier. Uh, most every business has an adequate number of parking spots, although some people grumble because they have to walk all the way from the far end of the parking lot. Right. But at least there's a space available for them. And many businesses do not have a place to store a bicycle or uh, lockers for rollerblades if that would be the transportation mode, those kind of things. Sorry. I know there's one business um, that I that I, I participate in this a lot um, out on the Centennial Trail that um, provides free water, ice water, to um, the, the people that pass by there. And, and when you get to that point, you definitely need some water. Mm -hmm. um, on a different topic, I wanted to ask each of you, um, we're pr in your work that you're doing, you're promoting multiple different uses. You're, you're, pr you're promoting walking, you're promoting riding, rollerblading, all these different activities. Is there any downside to having those multiple users not a downside, but is there maybe some guidelines that maybe a mom with a, that's pushing a stroller should be aware of as somebody that's training for a triathlon rides by them? I mean, is, is, should, should people be aware? Are there some rules of the road that people should maybe be aware of, Chris? Well, you know, we, have, we do have rules of the road, and probably the strongest would be for the bicyclists as far as, you know, we have uh, maximum uh, speed limits for the bicyclists on the trail systems. Uh, Any time, you know, uh, through the, the, the PED Bike Committee, we're going to be uh, creating some educational uh, opportunities to uh, educate not only the motorists but other, tr uh, other users, pedestrians, bicyclists, and everything as far as some of the safety uh, avenues, being conscientious that there are other users and other types of users on the trail. Those are all extremely critical. One of the concern areas that we have are the congested areas such as City Park. When you have, particularly in the summertime, when you have a lot of kids down there with their bicycles, they're going as fast as they can go, and there's little kids that are there to play in the park. So we need to educate the non-motorized vehiculists as well as the rest of the, the population. I mean, sometimes you get people that are that walk three, you know, three, three <laughs> people abreast that are in the heat of a conversation, and they may not hear you coming up behind them. So I think awareness is a is a huge tip. Oh, they're they're, they're, they're wearing uh, yeah, headphones. Yeah, headphones. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. One exactly. of the Tony, you're from down south. I spent time in in Texas, and one of the phrases down there is "drive friendly," and they have that up. Oh, and I think that's kind of a uh, we all as multiple people use it. If you're a biker, you know, slow down and go around people in a way that you'd like to be passed or let them know you're coming. And the same way with the walkers, don't take up the whole lane. And, uh, yeah. I think just becoming conscious, too, uh, of, of, of the potentials. I know one of my biggest, my biggest problems as a bicyclist are uh, people are safely walking their dogs on leashes, and the dog will be over on the right-hand side, but that dog can dart to the left just as quickly, and if that leash is long enough, uh, that does create problems for bicyclists. Uh, it creates problems for pedestrians if the dog is in a protective manner. So, And likewise, the, the cyclists need to be cognizant of where they are on the road, too. Sometimes they have the ability to pull over, but yet they're occupying a, a vehicle travel lane that's not necessary to do so. Another thing that a lot of people are doing that's very wise, especially if it's late afternoon or evening, uh, wearing certain kind of clothing off, uh, so that if you are having a cross where there's traffic, you know, you can be seen, they'll wear it on their back of their coat or on their shoes or whatever. <clears throat> that too is a, a safety issue. I want to, you're also supportive of inclusion, which I congratulate you for. You want everyone to, in the community to be respected. and That is so important. And I'm thinking of low-income people, children from very low-income families. I know you want everyone to be participating and involved. And some little kids can't afford a bicycle, uh, can't afford certain things, and it may keep them from that kind of enjoyment. What are you looking at for the future or would recommend how you can bring those uh, citizens into the process or those children can have what they need? Um, there, there are some things that some people are in such low income brackets that really they just don't have the funds for that. And who like, would like to start with that? Well, I think it's something, you're right, we want to be inclusive and get people uh, there. Um, 
It's not something that we've, that's not part of the specific mission, but I think it's something that as we promote cycling and promote activities like that, it will encourage, you know, we can work with bike shops, work with groups that may be able I to guess help. I have a motive of initiating this here. <laughs> and, but this community, and I, I don't mean just Coeur I mean this whole area, is incredibly generous. Uh, just looking lately where they raised well over a hundred, I think thirty thousand dollars for the hospice of wine tasting for the terminally ill and when the police officer was shot over a hundred thousand was raised one night at a function. Uh, the, the generosity here is so uh, remarkable. Would this not be something that your committee might look at to go into uh, to the well again with these generous people and say sure. that this might be something that you could consider that would be part of this this process of making this another component of your work. I think part of what we do need to do is identify the need. You know, a lot of people will respond if they know a need. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can take that, uh, just like the need for improvements of curb cuts or sidewalks for most of us aren't in wheelchairs. We don't think about mm -hmm. that. But then if we step forward and say, we know people that need that, then people respond. So I think your idea is, is a great idea. I think through an educational process, however, too, there you know there are bikes and there are bikes available. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the the school district and the county and the city have a joint auction every year, and there are usually hundreds of bicycles that uh, sell for as low as a dollar a piece. So there are there are bicycles out there for those that want them, but they have to be aware of of where to you know. There's some to more get advertising them. than exactly. Where. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit, uh, although we've, this, this has been very pleasing to me because we are looking towards the future and we have made recommendations or you have to our viewers and other communities that may be initiating this process, but we are going to show a few more photographs, Mike, and, uh, and the others uh, about what we have here. It's kind of going back to, re to close out the show and review it, and if they'll put up the first slide now, uh, here again is the issue that's very important with dealing with disability. <coughs> Mike, do you want to take that? Well, that's a... That's a uh, example of a missing, there's no curb cut there, and there, behind this truck there actually is one, but the curb cut is put in a position where if sh the person using that in a wheelchair or bicycle mm -hmm. would have to go out into the intersection, so the curb cut was misplaced. It was, well, sorry. No, no one ill-intentioned, but an example of here's an item that will be expensive to fix that if we were thinking when we put it in, it wouldn't have cost us any more. So. You're saying to the, the person, you've got to get out of the crosswalk where you're supposed to be because of the construction. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that particular uh, wheelchair is a motorized wheelchair. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, e that's e less difficult than a standard yeah. uh, wheelchair mm -hmm. because it actually, the force is actually throwing it out towards the center of the street. Yeah. One, uh, one so of the things. It doesn't thing make any difference which way the traffic's coming from. You're going to be in the, a traffic lane just because of the angle of the curb cut. Yes, right. And more and more of us in our population are going to face some type of disability as we get older. And we want to be able to be independent. We're Americans. We want to live on our own. And we forget about the barriers that we create for these people who can live on their own. But That's why your committee barriers. has done such a wise job because you're incorporating into your advising uh, different parts of the community. And since you don't have that particular disability, you might not think of it. Right. And this way it will happen. Let's go to the second photo. I think this photo particularly shows the, the disability of even healthy pedestrians to get safely across some intersections. This particular intersection is the on-ramp, the westbound on-ramp to I-90 off of 15th Street. And these two kids had made it across the ramp, but you can tell that they're concerned about the oncoming traffic. And as you look on up the street, there's nothing but traffic that time of day to contend with. And in addition to having the hazards that we have here, if you'll notice where the arrow is underneath the I-90 sign, and that bar that's across there is low enough that even those kids have to duck to go underneath the bar. There's no sidewalk going around. It reminds me of some of these that. virtual TV shows, where, what they call them, where they have to make these great challenges. And <laughs> of course, they get paid for those challenges. Right. And here, these poor people yeah. are, are being invited to do right. it for just the risk of doing it. I think what you know, if you the compounds this situation is this is this is on a it looks like a, a summer day or a spring day. Uh, put some put some ice and snow on the ground. Yeah. And and yeah. imagine those same kids are crossing that same street. 
The other sad thing is that's right across from one of our new parks with a yeah. skateboard or with a BMX track. So, and then it's up the street from Four a middle from school. school. And so here, uh, and a corridor that should be used by children, and is we set up barriers. For that. But you'll be to be congratulated because you're identifying these problems and going to deal with them. The third photo is another uh, issue. And that's just a matter of doing the practical things that will enhance pedestrian byways and, and that'd be just sweeping the sidewalks off in this particular case. It, it's a very low cost item but if that gravel's left there all summer it wears out shoes, it wears out yeah. uh, is patients. It, is it typical that a pole would be in the center of a sidewalk like that? Well I think this is another situation that, that that's really critical. Now this this is an older uh, uh, area if, if you look at one of our newer, uh, newer areas, uh, we, just had, we just revamped Northwest Boulevard a short time ago. And if you go down the sidewalk there, uh, had this committee been, been active uh, in those years, we would have had the opportunity to go out and say, no, you know, we can't put poles in the middle, or we can't put signs in the right. middle, or we can't put trees in the middle. Because it gets you get into areas where uh, wheelchairs can't even uh, can't even negotiate some of the areas on the Northwest Boulevard. Bicycle slides into that exactly. Mm -hmm. So there was one place where we actually had to remove a tree because there wasn't room between the fire plug and the, the tree for handicapped yeah. access. So th those aren't financial issues. Those no, are they're just wise think issues. about it before you. We're do just it. about out of time. We're going to rush to the number four. The photo number four. Uh, that's 15th Street. That shows kind of a before. You can see where some of the shoulder is paved, and yeah. then it gets to a point where it's not where paved. It is, Very inexpensive to come in and just throw some asphalt sure. down and, and put that. We're going to stop at that point and, and just simply say that those are really powerful examples, and this helps other communities are starting these plans. And so, as you're saying, Mike, it's just sometimes just a matter of thinking through uh, rather than talking about extra dollars. In fact, if you have to remove it, then it is more expensive. So. Uh, I want to thank all three of you, and Erna Reinhardt, I'm sure, joins me in saying thank you for most informative two programs. And while we're so pleased about them, not only for our community, but for other communities, to say uh, good planning makes a more livable community. And so you're on that path, and good luck to you in all your work, and, and we know that you will uh, make our community even more great place to live, which is already is a great place, believe me, greater. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, we bring the program to conclusion. I invite you to be with us again next week. At the same time, we'll talk about another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest-running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music